A waitress receives a note slipped under a napkin by a girl. Ten minutes later. Emma notices the peculiar behavior of the couple who received the note. She's taken aback but intrigued as she finds the handwritten message between the napkins. Her face flushes as she reads it, realizing she needs to act swiftly. The couple might leave any moment, and she can't let them escape. Emma lets the note fall to the floor and rushes to the doors, securing everyone inside. From the moment the couple enters the small diner, Emma senses something amiss. The girl's eyes hide behind oversized sunglasses. While the man guides her to a back table, Emma's gut feelings have been off before. But this time, they're intense. Despite her discomfort, she serves them, stacking menus and sighing as she approaches. If only she had known what she was getting into. Introducing herself, Emma receives minimal acknowledgement from the man. Engrossed in his phone, his girlfriend remains silent, fixated on the table. Emma, used to impolite customers, is about to face more than just rudeness. There's an inexplicable unease around the couple. The man constantly glances over his shoulder, while the girl remains motionless her sunglasses concealing most of her face, sharing her concern with a fellow waitress. Emma receives reassurance that there's nothing to worry about. Odd people are a common occurrence, but things are about to take a frightening turn. Emma convinces herself they'll leave eventually, comforting herself with the thought that she'll never have to encounter them again. She just needs to mind her own business. Emma managed to convince herself that everything was fine. Until she witnessed a tiny interaction between the couple. That sent shivers down her spine. Before she knew it. She found herself dialing 911. Born and raised in Franklin. Massachusetts. Emma Davis. A typical 22-year-old student. Split her time between campus studies and working as a waitress at a popular diner in town. Despite a year and a half of serving customers four days a week, she felt unprepared for what unfolded one Thursday afternoon. Rushing to her shift after enduring campus traffic, Emma barely made it in two minutes early, feeling particularly exhausted after submitting her semester's final assignment. Anxious to head home and catch her favorite TV show, Emma faced a challenging shift ahead. The initial two hours breezed by with usual. Pleasant interactions. Serving regular customers with decent tips. Emma was engrossed in routine when new customers entered. The door's bell echoed in the small space. But few paid attention. When Emma turned to greet them. Her stomach sank. The woman wore a thick scarf despite the 82 degrees Fahrenheit weather. Her face hidden behind large sunglasses. It struck Emma as odd. Why wear such heavy clothing in the heat? The man. Dressed in unkempt attire. Bore a tense expression. His furrowed brow and greased forehead not. Matching the usual friendly demeanor of the customers she served. She managed to convince herself that everything was fine until Emma observed a small interaction between the couple, causing an unsettling feeling that led her to dial 911. Emma Davis, a typical 22-year-old student from Franklin, Massachusetts, balanced her time between campus studies and her job as a waitress at a popular local diner. Despite her year and a half of experience serving customers four days a week, Emma felt unprepared for what unfolded one particular Thursday afternoon. Running almost late for her shift due to enduring half an hour of campus traffic. She felt relieved to clock in just two minutes early. Exhausted from submitting her final assignment for the semester. Emma eagerly anticipated going home to watch her favorite TV show. However. She knew she had a tough shift ahead. The first two hours passed swiftly. 
with no unusual encounters. It seemed like a typical day at work. Customers were pleasant. Leaving decent tips. Emma was in the midst of serving one of her. Regulars when the door swung open behind her. Signaling new arrivals. Though the bell rang. Barely anyone took notice. When Emma turned to greet the newcomers, her stomach clenched. She noticed distinct details immediately. The woman wore a thick scarf despite the 82 degrees Fahrenheit weather. Concealing her face behind large sunglasses. Emma found it peculiar. Why wear such heavy clothing in such heat? The man. Dressed in disheveled attire. Had a tense expression. A far cry from the friendly demeanor she was. Accustomed to encountering from her customers. It immediately struck Emma that the man was a few years older than the girl. Their hands tightly clasped. He almost pulled her to a table in the back. Once seated in Emma's section, she gathered two menus with a heavy sigh before approaching their table. Sensing an unsettling feeling in her stomach. Despite her unease, she maintained her usual polite demeanor. Hi. My name is Emma. I'll be serving you today. Is there anything I can get you in the meantime? She asked. Trying to mask her discomfort. The man barely acknowledged her presence, muttering their drink orders. His girlfriend remained fixated on the wooden table before her. Seemingly oblivious to Emma's presence. Emma couldn't shake the feeling that something suspicious was happening. Putting through their drink orders. Emma noticed the man didn't consult his girlfriend. He simply ordered for her. Red flags waved in Emma's mind. The girl appeared as suspicious as her partner. Avoiding eye contact and refusing to speak. Whenever Emma approached. Observing their table from a distance. Emma confided her suspicions to a fellow waitress. But her concerns were dismissed. Her friend brushed it off. Citing that encountering odd people was commonplace and not something to dwell on. Emma tried to shake off her suspicions. Focusing on other tables in her section. Once she diverted her attention, things seemed easier. With just two more hours left in her shift, Emma eagerly anticipated going home. She had her evening planned out and hoped to leave behind the oddities of that encounter at the diner. Set on lounging on her couch with a pile of snacks. And binge watching her favorite show. Emma's plans seemed distant as she realized. She wouldn't be home anytime soon. Yet. The gripping narrative wasn't over. And if you haven't already. Please subscribe to our channel and hit the. Notification bell to keep up with these real life stories every day. Now. Back to the story. Approaching their table once more. Emma took their food orders. The man once again spoke for his girlfriend. Ordering a large pizza for himself and deciding she'd have the Greek salad. Did he just dictate her lunch choice? The girl remained silent. Lowering her head and fidgeting with her hands. Emma. Feeling uneasy. Nodded and stepped away. She tried to remind herself that their interaction wasn't her concern. But the discomfort tightened her stomach into knots. Mindlessly inputting their orders into the system. Emma's eyes wandered back to their table. That's when she noticed a subtle interaction between the couple. Each time the man was distracted by his phone. The girl attempted to move away. However. The moment he noticed. He forcefully pulled her back. Controlling not just her food choice but also where she sat. Sickened by what she observed. Emma's hands trembled as she approached their table. Doubt crept in. Was it as terrible as she thought? Uncertain about what to do. She felt a sense of urgency and unease as she made. Her way back to their table. Emma grappled with uncertainty about the best course of action. Feeling an urgent need to intervene. As she placed their meals on the table. 
she made a deliberate effort to address the girl directly. There you go. Please let me know if there's anything I can do to make the experience more comfortable for you. She said, locking eyes with the girl. Surprisingly, the girl glanced back at Emma as she walked away, casting a glance over her shoulder. Throughout her shift, Emma served other tables but intermittently checked on the couple. Sensing something awry. Waiting for any sign. She couldn't shake the feeling that things were not right. Yet she underestimated the severity. Moments later. While attending another table. Emma noticed motion near the couple's table. Startled. She turned to see the girl signaling her over. Approaching with nervous anticipation. Emma politely asked. What can I do for you? Ma'am. The girl requested the salad to go and handed Emma a stack of napkins. Could you take these with you? She asked. Hinting at Emma to check them. You might want to check on them. She added cryptically. Handing over the napkins. Confused. Emma complied. But upon inspecting the napkins. She found them perfectly clean. Puzzled. She hurriedly packed the untouched salad to go. When asked about the stack of napkins, she shrugged it off, explaining that a customer requested the check. However, her confusion lingered. Was the girl needlessly burdening her with extra work for no apparent reason? Emma placed the stack of napkins on the counter. And as they landed on the cold marble, she noticed peculiar black lines on one. Investigating further, she picked it up and saw messy, almost indecipherable writing inside, struggling to make sense of it. She scrutinized every letter, finally deciphering the message. Shocked, she dropped the napkin and bolted towards the manager, her voice trembling as she explained the situation, her heart pounding. Realizing the urgency, the manager remained composed and directed Emma to lock the doors to prevent the couple from leaving. While Emma secured the doors, he swiftly called 911, requesting immediate assistance. With the diner now secured, no one would be allowed to enter or leave. Standing by the doors, Emma tried to stay calm taking deep breaths to quell her rising panic. As she glanced back, she noticed the girl's eyes fixed on her, attempting a smile that faltered quickly. Emma couldn't shake the worry. How long had this been happening? What if they hadn't come to the diner that ordinary Thursday afternoon? The girl's note flashed in Emma's mind, hinting at something sinister. Closing her eyes, she hoped for the swift arrival of the police. Fearing the extent of the situation, the manager approached with the note, preparing to show it to the arriving authorities, uncertain if it would suffice for an arrest. Relief flooded Emma as she spotted flashing blue lights through the window. Help had finally arrived, and she felt a sense of reassurance with the authorities on the scene. Emma swiftly unlocked the doors allowing the officers to step inside. As the girl watched from afar and her boyfriend remained unaware, one of the officers addressed the manager, inquiring, What can I help you with today? Sir. The manager handed over the note, observing as the officer struggled to decipher the girl's messy handwriting. Slowly, the officer's expression shifted to one of horror as he read aloud. Please send help. He won't let me leave. He'll hurt me. The chilling message sent shivers down their spines. Emma pointed toward the couple's table, prompting the officers to act. With no hesitation, they approached the table, swiftly grabbing the man by his arm and pulling him away. Sir, we'd like to have a word with you outside. They insisted. Despite his resistance, the officers escorted him out, pressing him against a patrol car. 
As the officers intervened, the girl rushed to Emma. Embracing her tightly, tears streaming down her face. Thank you so much. She sobbed into Emma's shoulder. Stepping back. She removed her sunglasses. Revealing a large black bruise around one eye. Emma couldn't help but shed a few tears herself. Realizing the extent of the girl's suffering. An abusive relationship with no apparent way out. The officers took action. Arresting the man and assuring the girl of her safety. She could finally rest peacefully. Knowing he wouldn't bother her again. However. The girl couldn't shake the worry of what might unfold once he was released. The fear of the unknown lingered. Casting a shadow over her newfound peace. Hello and welcome to today's story. Margarita stepped into her son's room. Taking in the sight before her. She let out a sigh. A soft smile gracing her lips. I'll tidy up in here. She murmured to herself. Maybe I'll discard unnecessary items. She continued. Contemplating the five years that had passed since her dear Danny left. Five whole years without him. It had been that long since Margarita's son. Daniel. Tragically passed away. Today. She made the decision to sift through his belongings. Untouched for all these years. Despite her reluctance. She began the task. Everything remained exactly as it was during his life. Her hands hesitated. Unwilling to disrupt Daniel's established order. Nevertheless. She gathered a stack of books and notebooks from the shelf. Placing them on the table to sort through. As she went through the items. A bright card slipped out. A keepsake from a past holiday. Margarita turned it over. Her eyes scanning the handwritten message from her son. Mommy. I love you. The words pierced through her. The pain as raw as it was over five years ago. She felt her legs give way as she leaned against the wall. Sliding helplessly to the floor. It was as if the anguish was happening all over again. She wanted to cry out. To deny the reality. But deep down. She knew it wouldn't alleviate the permanent pain that. Had settled in her soul. Her son. Young. Handsome. And full of life. Had only been sixteen. A future brimming with promise. Happiness. And success was expected for him. Of that. His mother was certain. Everyone around him believed the same. Daniel was well liked. But fate or perhaps mere coincidence had decided otherwise. After gathering herself from another wave of grief. She caught her breath. Stealing herself for the continuation of the task at hand. Margarita glanced around the room once more. Grappling with the painful truth. I'll never see you as an adult. You would have turned 21 by now. She whispered to herself. Maybe everything would have changed in this room. Maybe you would have left home and started your own life. But no. She continued. The weight of the unchanged room sinking in. Everything here remained the same as before. You'll never get married. I won't have grandchildren. I won't have anything. You left and never returned. And my time stopped. The cruel memory swept Margarita back to that dreadful day. Their last moments together. Her son. Daniel. Was preparing for a hiking trip with his classmates. He was a part of the hiking club. And while they often organized gatherings. They had never ventured so far and for so long before. Margarita helped him pack. A worrisome feeling settling in her heart. She attempted to mask her doubts. Engaging in casual conversation. Take spare socks. What if yours get soaked? They won't take up much space. She advised. Trying to ease her concerns. Did you pack the first aid kit? Mom. I've been on trips before. 
Why are you so worried? Daniel reassured her, though Margarita sensed his effort to suppress his irritation. It's just for two weeks. The first time. Believe me. All the moms of your friends are just as worried right now. I can't even imagine what will happen when I get drafted into the army. Daniel continued. Perhaps trying to lighten the mood. Margarita didn't want to entertain such thoughts just yet. Let's worry about that when the time comes. Will Senor be with you? Of course. He's our instructor. Don't worry. Please. Daniel insisted. Trying to comfort her. You'll be laughing at yourself in two weeks when I come back. Margarita attempted to inject humor into the conversation. Those nerve cells will be all gone. Or do you want me not to go and tell my friends that my mom didn't let me? I really want that. But I know you won't do it. Even for the sake of my nerve cells. Daniel replied. Trying to lighten the mood. That became the final day she shared a joke. Laughter deserted her for an entire week after that. Margarita desperately attempted to quell her worries. And she almost succeeded. Her son seemed fine. Which brought her some relief. Only seven days left. And maybe they'll come back earlier. Even if it's just for a day. She thought optimistically. Let's hope nothing goes wrong. No money lost. No shortage of food. Let everything go according to plan. What would one extra day give me? Nothing. The main thing is that my son is okay. Happy. And content. At that time. Margarita was still legally married. There was a stamp in her passport identifying her as the wife of her son's father. However. Their relationship had ended several years prior. She pushed the memories of that story aside. Surviving the collapse of her personal life by choosing to forget everything. Discussions about divorce had surfaced. But it never seemed opportune for her husband. And a year before the tragedy. When he began talking about it again. Margarita was the one to suggest waiting until their son finished school. I'm not in a hurry for anything. Isn't it time to end this already? Her husband had pressed. Our son isn't stupid. He understands everything perfectly. Margarita had no objections. But their son sensed something amiss between his parents. Despite this. They maintained a peaceful coexistence. Upholding a facade of friendliness. Their apartment with just two rooms had no space for separate living. A screen erected at night and hidden behind a wardrobe. During the day created the illusion of a normal. Complete family. Both parents believed it was enough. And perhaps even Daniel thought so too. Dad lives at home. He just works a lot sometimes. Even at night. What could be wrong with that? He might have mused. However. That night. He didn't stay home. At the beginning of the second week of the hiking trip. Margarita spoke to her son in the evening over the phone. Daniel's cheerful voice offered momentary reassurance. But as she retired to bed. Thoughts of her boy sleeping in a forest tent lingered. Even if there's no danger. It's still cold. Damp. And there are mosquitoes. You never know what could happen. She mused. Her mind refusing to ease. If I want to worry. Nothing will stop me. She thought with a hint of self-mockery. Attempting to pacify herself. Albeit in vain. Despite her desire for sleep. She found herself waking abruptly towards dawn. Sitting up in bed. Crying out in alarm. Daniel. She exclaimed. Her heart racing. Struggling to comprehend her sudden panic. What's wrong with me? Did I dream something I can't remember? Or is this what a panic attack looks like? But why would that happen at night? Her mind raced with worry for her son. Oh God. 
What if something happened to my son out there? Somewhere far away. Panic consumed her once more. She rose. Turning on the lights and inspecting her son's room. It was all in order. Everything as it always was. Yet. The unease persisted. Sleep was out of the question. She paced the apartment. An overwhelming sense of impending disaster driving her movements. Unable to bear the anxiety. She reached for her phone. Surprised by the tremble in her hands. She was determined to call her son, regardless of the late hour. Fine. Then. I'll call anyway. Let him grumble. Let him say whatever he wants. But I can't take it anymore. I can't wait until morning. She resolved. Despite it being nighttime and him likely sleeping in the tent with others. She dialed his number. The phone rang for what felt like an eternity until. The mechanical voice declared that the subscriber wasn't answering. I hear it myself that he's not answering. What do I do now? She murmured. Trying to calm herself amidst the rising panic. Everyone is still asleep. Tired from running around. The fresh air. Strong nerves. That's the youth. Not like me jumping up in the middle of the night. Calm down. Call in an hour. Listen to everything that's coming to you for this panic. For the next hour she paced around the apartment. Finally noticing the sun's ascent and the bird's morning songs. I guess it's okay to call now, she muttered nervously. Contemplating the prospect of no answer. Summoning courage. She dialed again. Silently pleading. Daniel. Please. Just answer. Say that everything's fine. And I won't call even once until you come back. But there was no response. Her anxiety grew as the morning morphed into a haunting ordeal. No answer from her son or any of his friends. Not even the instructor. Senor Sansa. The silence was deafening. And the uncertainty felt like a nightmare. A prelude to a dreadful reality. Yet. Even those terrifying moments of uncertainty. Would later be reminisced as moments of fleeting happiness. Hope lingered. Albeit faintly. Until closer to lunchtime when certainty finally arrived. Margarita received the unbearable news. Her son was no more. He had drowned at dawn. The true nightmare had just begun. Margarita's recollection of the aftermath was fragmented. Memories hazy and disjointed. The instructor's call informing her of the tragedy caused her to scream in refusal. Unable to accept what had transpired. Then. As suddenly as her outcry. She froze. As if life itself was leaving her. By that time. Her husband had returned. He called for emergency help. And injections were administered. Days blurred into nights. The sun occasionally peeking through. Yet. In the wake of her unfathomable loss. Time itself seemed to lose all meaning. Margarita witnessed her husband's tearful outbursts, hearing his anguished cries. You convinced him to join the hiking club. Why did you let him go on that trip? Her husband's rescue was to blame someone for their son's death. He threatened to hold all responsible for Daniel's. Death accountable for negligence or fault. Except those who were alive. Why? Who's to blame? He cried out in despair. For Margarita. These emotional confrontations were out of reach. She couldn't summon tears. She knew it was her fault. The mother's fault. That everyone was alive except for Daniel. In her mind. Nothing was left for her. Attempts were made to find someone to blame. But it seemed like there was no single person at fault. On that fateful day. Everything had seemed normal. They responded to investigators. Scared teens confronted with the reality of death for the first time. No. 
Nobody hurt Daniel. No. We didn't fight. Nobody planned to swim at dawn. Everyone slept. Including Daniel. Like all of us. They explained. It seemed someone might have called for help. But they dismissed it as just a noise and went back to sleep. Ultimately. There was no one to blame. Daniel drowned because he had ventured into the water on his own accord. That was it. For Margarita. None of this mattered. She prepared for her son's funeral. Living as if on autopilot. Breathing. Moving. Eating. Drinking. Without allowing herself to dwell on the closed door of her son's room, she existed because life continued. Even though hers had ceased to have any meaning. People say sorrow brings individuals closer. But in Margarita's case. Shared grief only worsened their estrangement. Perhaps it was due to their earlier loss of connection. But after the tragedy. Her husband and wife began avoiding each other. They didn't console one another or share comforting gestures. Even when they were alone in the apartment. They consciously avoided making eye contact. The experiences became even more unbearable. Perhaps that's why. After some time. Maybe on the ninth day. Or later, who was counting these days? Margarita watched her husband pack his things. Sorry. Mara. But it will be better this way. Maybe I shouldn't leave now. But our cohabitation has lost all meaning. He expressed. Don't worry. I won't claim this apartment in the divorce. I'll file myself. If something is needed. Call me. Okay. She responded with apathy. Her heart scorched by the overwhelming pain of life's biggest tragedy. She didn't engage with these words. They were insignificant in comparison to her immense loss. Everything has lost all meaning. She quietly uttered to herself. As the door closed behind her ex-husband. The apartment became completely empty and cold. Let me be just like you. My little son. She thought. I'm gone too. Margarita found no solace in her surroundings. Before the tragedy. She was a sociable woman with numerous friends and acquaintances. It seemed even after what had happened. That she shouldn't remain in solitude. Yet. She did initially. Upon hearing of Margarita's immense sorrow. People rushed to her. Wanting to support and offer help. To express sympathy. But instead of the vibrant and friendly Margie they knew. They were met by a dried up. Unfriendly older woman. It was completely understandable. Such grief changes a person. People didn't know how to behave or what to. Do in the face of such overwhelming sorrow. While many had experienced various troubles in life and suffered losses. Margarita was in a state of complete collapse. A world of her own. And in those terrifying moments. She didn't need anyone. I hear you. Thank you. Everything's all right. She would say, turning away and withdrawing into herself. Nothing could change the situation. People understood that they couldn't offer any meaningful help. Moreover, Margarita wasn't in a position to accept help at that time. We're probably torturing her in vain. Someone remarked. Better leave her alone. Let her navigate through this on her own. The uncertainty of what would come afterward lingered. People decided not to burden her with their sympathy. Persuasions. Or convictions. Some believed that grief was contagious. Especially among friends who were also mothers. All with children of roughly the same age. Each engaged in their own hobbies and often bearing. Their own inherent dangers. Margarita found herself enveloped in an invisible circle of misfortune. A circle from which others hesitated to approach. Fearing they too might fall into its grasp. She remained isolated within this circle. 
surprisingly unbothered by the solitude. In fact, she felt a sense of calmness in her solitude. A tranquility that she didn't experience amidst others. After some time following the funeral, she attempted to return to work, trying to maintain a semblance of normalcy. However, Margarita had changed so drastically that even those who had known her for years failed to recognize her. Her demeanor. Her character. It was all different now. While she dutifully performed her tasks without making mistakes, she couldn't engage in the usual camaraderie. Her colleagues, predominantly women, continued their conversations about personal and domestic matters, discussing their children, husbands, laughing and joking. But with Margarita, all of this became inconceivable. Her colleagues felt it was sacrilegious to carry on as if nothing had happened in front of someone who had experienced such a profound loss. Margarita hadn't smiled since her son's passing, and she realized how much her demeanor complicated the lives of those who had always been kind to her. She knew she couldn't change anything. Her grief would persist, leaving her perpetually altered. In an attempt not to disrupt the work environment, Margarita approached her manager and requested to be transferred to the dispatch room. The manager, taken aback, questioned her decision. Why would you do that? The salary there is much lower. I'm okay with that. Replied the reserved and changed Margarita. You understand. It's hard for me. And it's hard for everyone when I'm around. Maybe you're wrong about that. The manager tried to convince her. They say on the contrary. When there's grief. It's easier to endure it together with others. However. Understanding Margarita's situation well enough. The manager. Without further discussion. Signed her transfer application. Margarita found solace in solitude. Occupying a small room where she handled phone calls. Distributed keys. And managed documents. The idea of rejoining her former team didn't cross her mind. She brought books. Not fiction but stories about love. Happiness. And motherhood. Yet. It was all too unbearable. Turning to historical books. She found some comfort in learning about events from the distant past. Realizing that life had carried on before her and even before Daniel. People had suffered and died. But the world persisted. Something she struggled to comprehend for herself. Secluded in this small room. Which felt akin to a coffin. Margarita had isolated herself. Previously. An elderly and cheerful woman occupied this space, drawing people to the area. But now, encountering Margarita's extinguished gaze, they hurriedly left. After work, she returned to her desolate apartment, which was gradually transforming into a tomb. Unintentionally, Margarita discovered a corner where life seemed to endure, Daniel's room. It felt as if the spirit of her departed son lingered there. Everything remained exactly as Daniel had left it. Books. Notes. Pencils. And various items whose names she either didn't know or had forgotten. She refrained from disturbing anything. Fearing it might dispel Daniel's lingering presence. Once a week. She tenderly cleaned the room. Cautiously wiping dust from surfaces and vacuuming the carpet. In the evenings. She spent hours there. Conversing with her son as though he were still alive. She cherished this solitary connection. If anyone discovered this tendency of hers. They might assume she had gone mad or insist on treatment. The mere thought of someone dismantling Daniel's room terrified her. Everything had to remain untouched preserving her son's memory within those walls. Margarita didn't consider herself mad. She simply found solace in the only person she could truly converse with. 
her son. Even if he couldn't reply. She was convinced he could hear her. Sensing his presence nearby. Even in the cemetery. Where she visited almost every week. She didn't feel the same connection with her son as she did in his room. There. He remained alive. A presence that helped her cope. Regain her senses. And hold on to herself amid the relentless grief. After her days alone in the dispatch room. She rushed home to talk to her son. Sharing the happenings of her day. Seeking advice. Complaining. Though receiving no answers, she hadn't gone crazy. She didn't hear voices or see ghosts. But this interaction. One-sided as it was. Offered her a semblance of connection that made navigating. The world slightly more bearable. However. For others. Life went on. As time passed. People started forgetting about Margarita's tragedy. Those unfamiliar with her past wondered why she. Remained perpetually gloomy and reserved in the dispatch room. Can't she make her face a bit simpler for the sake of working with people? A young colleague complained. In a conversation overheard by Margarita. A colleague shared her own experiences of loss. Trivializing grief. Everyone loses someone. The colleague stated. My beloved grandmother died. And my uncle. My dad's brother. Last summer. So what? I cried a bit and continued living. The weight of those words lingered heavily for Margarita. Her grief refused to loosen its grip. Even for a moment. It seemed as if she couldn't forget about her son. Not even for a brief respite. Returning to thoughts of her son brought Margarita greater pain. She often wore black attire after his passing. But one morning. While preparing for work. She decisively set aside her black blouse and chose something. From her closet that wasn't colorful but also wasn't as dark. Surprisingly. This change in clothing impacted her mood and facial expression. Making her wonder if she had the right to try to forget. To want to distract herself. Or if doing so would offend her son's memory. She debated within herself. Unsure if changing her appearance would convey readiness for life when. In reality. She wasn't ready at all. Despite these doubts. She resolved that she couldn't continue to be a source of distress for others. I'm not old yet. She thought. Considering the possibility that her appearance might. Inadvertently offend her son's memory. She remembered how her son loved it when she looked nice in the evening. In an almost conversational manner. She voiced her thoughts aloud. Asking Daniel's opinion on whether she should put on. Some makeup before work. There were no responses. But suddenly. A little bird landed on the window sill. It hopped up and down a few times before flying away cheerfully. As if in agreement. Taking it as a sign. She decided to make a change. Gradually. People ceased avoiding the dispatch room where she was stationed. Instead of seeing a gloomy older woman. They now encountered a reserved and serious individual. They rationalized that such people also existed. Those who cared for their appearance. Dressed decently. And diligently went to work. Margarita never seriously considered making substantial changes in her life. Convinced that they weren't meant for her. However. One spring day. As she was leaving the cemetery after tending to her son's grave. A man approached her. Around the age of 50. Margarita had noticed the man at the cemetery before. With a sympathetic smile. She acknowledged his presence. Understanding the shared sorrow that brought them both to that place. He expressed his frequent visits. Mentioning the resting places of his loved ones. His parents and his wife. Who had passed away a year ago. Buried beside their daughter. Who had been a mere baby. Acknowledging life's unpredictability. 
He shared his perspective on their common grounds. Margarita signed in response. Not inclined to discuss her own reasons for visiting. It seemed the man perceived her silence and shifted the conversation to lighter topics. Commenting on the pleasant weather and upcoming summer plans. Margarita regretted engaging in the initial conversation. Pondering if a simple nod and departure might have sufficed. However, as they walked outside the gates, he unexpectedly invited her to a nearby cafe. A place he mentioned was suitable for individuals like them. Hosting memorial events in a serene and quiet atmosphere. Surprised at herself, Margarita found she was unexpectedly thirsty. Having been at the cemetery for about two hours without water. Initially uninterested in such places and conversations. She hesitantly agreed. Feeling the need to comply after accepting his invitation. Reluctantly. She found herself at the cafe. Engaging in conversation with the man as they. Got to know each other over drinks. Margarita found herself in conversation with Victor. A widower whose troubles were evident. But who appeared to be a good man despite the challenges he had faced. As they talked about life and shared their respective difficulties. They departed after an hour. With Victor proposing they exchange phone. Numbers and meet outside the cemetery next time. Margarita. However. Expressed her inability to commit to such interactions. Confessing her lack of strength. She explained that she went through the motions out of obligation. Forcing herself to maintain a facade of normalcy to avoid unsettling others. She was straightforward about her disinclination. For any relationships or friendships. Having severed previous connections intentionally. Victor. While sympathizing with their shared troubles. Emphasized the importance of moving forward despite the challenges. Margarita's unwavering stance remained. And they parted ways without exchanging contact. Details or making any promises. Surprisingly. Margarita felt relief rather than sadness about this encounter. Finding herself incapable of reacting to new people just. As she couldn't engage with the old ones. Some time later. Margarita encountered Victor once more near the cemetery. Engaging in conversation with another frequent visitor. After five years of accustomed solitude. Margarita found herself without a job. Her position as a dispatcher in an unprofitable enterprise. Was eliminated due to downsizing. She lost a small yet steady income. Lacking significant savings and support to navigate. This sudden change in circumstances. Margarita remained entirely alone. A situation she attributed to her own choices. She didn't assign blame to anyone. Understanding that there weren't acquaintances in her. Life capable of finding her a new job or offering substantial. Assistance beyond mere sympathy. Something she couldn't benefit from. Instead. She found solace in speaking about her troubles to her son. Her beloved and sole confidant for the past few years. Although he couldn't respond. Articulating her thoughts aloud helped her navigate. Her emotions and considerations. Perhaps by vocalizing everything, she hoped to reach a decision. In the evening, Margarita entered her son's room. Taking her customary seat beside his bed. Addressing him. She sighed and began to share her distress. Danny. My life has lost all its meaning. I lost my job due to downsizing. I'm unnecessary both at work and in this world. It seems. Tomorrow morning. I won't need to go anywhere. It's frightening. She poured out her concerns about her future. Expressing fear about sustaining herself without employment. She confessed her overwhelming feeling of not being needed in the world. How will I pay for the apartment? How will I even live? Do I need to live? If only you could take me with you. Daniel. Perhaps there. We'll find a place for me. 
following this heartfelt conversation with her son. She resolved to tidy up his room, contemplating it might be the first and possibly the last time she would go through his belongings. Margarita stumbled upon that same card bearing the words, Mommy, I love you. Overcome with emotion, she sank onto the chair, clutching the card tightly to her chest, and tears streamed down her face, a release she hadn't experienced in a long time. I love you too. My son, you were the only one who loved me, the only one who will never leave. Why are you silent? My dear, give me some sign. Gazing out the window, she hoped for some kind of signal. Perhaps another bird. Yet her son remained silent. It dawned on her that if she wanted to communicate with him, she might have to go where he is now. The uncertainty of such a reunion weighed heavily on her mind. Exiting the room with the card clutched close, she proceeded to the kitchen. Mechanically turning on the kettle and reheating some food. Engaging in routine tasks without full awareness only. Reinforced her sense of futility. Margarita felt incapable of making any decisive choices. In her current state of exhaustion. Overwhelmed and drained. She hurried to bed. Slipping into sleep almost instantly. In her dream. Margarita engaged in a conversation with her son, experiencing a level of clarity and meaning she hadn't before. Daniel's image was hazy, yet his voice resonated clearly, carrying the wisdom of an older, more seasoned individual. You're not alone. Mom. Can't you feel that I'm always with you? Of course. You can feel it. I see that. It's just a pity that you don't realize how difficult it is for me because you can't let me go. Letting go doesn't mean forgetting or parting with me forever. It means not allowing negative thoughts. It means living on, continuing your life. Mine has ended, but yours continues. It was supposed to continue if you allowed it. Everything has ended for me. Margarita insisted. It ended then. And it ended completely today. I have no reason to live anymore. Daniel pressed on, urging his mother to embrace life. If you leave now, neither you nor I will ever find peace. Live for me. Be happy for me. And I will help you. You'll be happy. Mom. Margarita couldn't fathom happiness without him. But how can I be happy without you? Daniel? I don't need anyone but you. You'll find that love meant for me can be shared. He gently encouraged. It's better to give it to someone who needs your love. I'll help you find that person. As she awoke. Tears wetting her face. Margarita grappled with the weight of these words. Feeling both the ache of separation and a glimmer of hope for a different path forward. In the dream, Margarita had a profound conversation with her son that felt unmistakably real, leaving her pondering its meaning and impact. As she awoke, the reality of her solitude surrounded her, intensifying her search for signs of Daniel's presence. The morning outside was cold and bleak, a reflection of her internal turmoil. Deciding to visit the cemetery, Margarita encountered a gentle rain. The dampness mirroring her emotional state. Approaching her son's grave. She placed her hand on the cold fence. Contemplating whether Daniel would have something to say today. There were no audible words. But a sense of connection. As if her son's hand rested atop hers. Brought a serene smile to her face. In that moment. Amidst the intensifying rain and darkening sky, Margarita made a silent promise to her son. I'm letting you go. Daniel. I truly want you to find peace where you are. For your sake. I'm ready for anything. This realization, though brought upon by the emotional conversation, 
filled her heart with a newfound brightness. Embracing her son's wish to live on. Margarita pledged not to hold on to her grief any longer. With a resolve to move forward and learn to live again. She embarked on a journey toward a life that had been elusive for so long. Margarita's heart ached at the boy's words. Understanding his profound loss at such a tender age. She knelt beside him. Feeling a strong sense of empathy and compassion. I'm so sorry. She whispered. Placing a gentle hand on his shoulder. Do you come here often? The boy nodded silently. His eyes fixed on the monument. Margarita felt a wave of sadness wash over her. Empathizing with his loneliness and the weight of his grief. Do you have anyone to take care of you? She asked softly. Already dreading the potential answer. The boy shook his head. His eyes brimming with unshed tears. Margarita's heart swelled with a mix of sorrow and determination. She couldn't leave this child alone at the cemetery. Come with me. She said gently. Offering her hand. Let's find someone who can help us. The boy hesitated for a moment. Looking up at Margarita's face. Slowly. He took her hand. And together they walked away from the graves. Seeking assistance and comfort for the grieving child. Margarita's heart sank witnessing the child's distress. Feeling an urgency to help him. She crouched down to meet his gaze. Her voice soft but determined. You won't go to the orphanage. I promise. No one should have to face such things at your age. She wiped the boy's tears gently with her hand. What's your name? The boy hesitated for a moment before replying. I'm Alex. Well. Alex. I'm Margarita. How about we find a warm place to sit and talk? Margarita suggested. Hoping to divert his attention from the sadness of the cemetery. I have no place to go. Alex mumbled. His eyes downcast. Margarita felt a tug at her heartstrings. How about we go to my place? It's warm and dry. And we can figure things out from there. Alex looked up at her with a mix of apprehension and hope. Margarita took his hand and led him away from the cemetery. Determined to find a safe haven for this lonely child. Margarita observed the child's forlorn expression and tried to reassure him. Hoping to engage him in a conversation. Gabby. YC is a way of saying yes in another language. And no. I don't want to take you to the orphanage. I want to help you find a better place. A happier place. Gabby nibbled at the pastry but seemed more preoccupied. With his thoughts than the food. Can I tell you a secret? Aunt Mara? Of course. Gabby. You can tell me anything. He leaned in closer. As if sharing something truly important. Sometimes. I see my parents in my dreams. They tell me things. They told me not to trust the big kids at the orphanage. But I didn't listen. I thought they were just dreams. Margarita listened intently. Recognizing the depth of Gabby's emotions. It's okay. Gabby. Sometimes dreams can be more than just dreams. Maybe your parents are trying to help you in their own way. Gabby's eyes widened. Do you think they're really trying to help me? Margarita nodded gently. Yes I do. And I promise you. We'll find a better place for you. Gabby seemed to relax a bit. And they finished their snacks together. Margarita made a mental note to seek help for Gabby. Considering the boy's delicate situation. She hoped to find him a safer environment than the orphanage. One where he could find happiness and support. As Margarita accompanied Gabby back to the orphanage. She couldn't shake the feeling that perhaps this encounter. Was more than a coincidence. Gabby's presence felt like an unexpected opportunity. To bring some light into her life. A chance to find meaning again. When they reached the orphanage. 
Margarita was resolved. She talked to the caretaker. Explaining that she was ready to be Gabby's guardian. To offer him a loving home. The caretaker. Surprised but understanding. Promised to explore the possibility. To ensure Gabby's best interests. I'll visit often. Gabby. Margarita assured him. And I'll do everything I can to bring you home with me. Gabby's eyes sparkled with newfound hope. Aunt Mara. Thank you. I'll wait for you. And I promise. I'll be good. Margarita left the orphanage. Her heart lighter than it had been in years, she felt a sense of purpose. A glimmer of the happiness that she hadn't experienced since her son's passing. As she walked back to her empty apartment, she realized that she had found a reason to live. To bring joy to Gabby's life. She called the orphanage every day, seeking updates and providing whatever information they required. Margarita was determined to make this happen. In her mind, she envisioned transforming Daniel's room into a warm, welcoming space for Gabby. Days turned into weeks. And finally, the call came. The caretaker confirmed that Gabby would be joining Margarita. Overjoyed and teary-eyed, Margarita rushed to prepare the apartment, making sure everything was perfect for her new little friend. When she arrived at the orphanage, Gabby was waiting, his belongings packed, and a radiant smile on his face. As they left for Margarita's home, hand in hand, she felt a surge of happiness and fulfillment she hadn't known in a long time. As they approached the apartment building, Gabby turned to Margarita, his eyes shining. Aunt Mara, do you think we'll be happy? Margarita squeezed his hand gently and smiled, feeling a sense of hope and a newfound purpose in her heart. Yes. Gabby. I do believe we'll be happy. Margarita waited patiently, her mind racing with thoughts about the arrangements needed to ensure she could see Gabby often. The caregiver returned after a few minutes, and Margarita approached her with a hopeful yet apprehensive expression. Thank you for your understanding. Margarita began. I'd like to discuss the possibility of visiting Gabby regularly. I want to be a part of his life. To offer him a loving home. The caregiver listened attentively. We appreciate your concern. But there's a process for these things. You see. We'll need to arrange for official visits and evaluations. It might take some time. Margarita nodded understandingly. I'll cooperate with whatever procedures are necessary. Please. Do what's best for Gabby. As the caregiver took her leave. Margarita felt a mixture of anxiety and anticipation. She knew it wouldn't be easy to navigate the bureaucratic processes. But she was determined to bring Gabby home. Days turned into weeks. And Margarita diligently followed the prescribed procedures. Attending meetings. Filling out forms. And providing every document required. It was a trying time. But she persevered. Motivated by the prospect of having Gabby at home. Finally. The day arrived when Margarita received the call she had been eagerly awaiting. After numerous assessments and discussions, they approved her as Gabby's guardian. Overwhelmed with joy, Margarita rushed to the orphanage, her heart pounding with excitement. She entered the familiar hall, her eyes searching for Gabby. And there he was, smiling brightly as he ran toward her. Enveloping her in a warm hug. Aunt Mara. They said I can come home with you. Are we really going home together now? Gabby's eyes sparkled with happiness. Yes. My dear Gabby. Margarita replied. Her voice filled with emotion. We're going home together. As they left the orphanage. Gabby held Margarita's hand tightly. The journey ahead might have its challenges. 
but they were ready to face them together. Forging a bond that would bring new hope and happiness into both their lives. Margarita waited independently for the caregiver and expressed her emotions. You know. This boy really touched me. I've been alone since my own son passed away five years ago. My husband had left even before that. And I hadn't considered anything like this before. But seeing Gabby made me realize that I need to adopt a child. Otherwise. Life might feel completely empty. I'm just 43. Which means I might have a long time ahead. When I think about that. Yes. You're right. I should talk to the head of the orphanage about adoption and visitations. I won't change my mind. I know there are people who get sentimental when they see an orphan child. Promise everything. But later. They reconsider and wonder why they need someone else's child. But I won't do that. I've been pondering for five years about the purpose of my life. Maybe Gabby needs my love and care. And maybe that's the reason to keep going. Margarita sought permission from the head of the orphanage to visit Gabby. However. Adoption might pose challenges. The primary condition was a stable and official job. Which Margarita hadn't held for the past two days. I'll find a job in the next couple of days. I have an apartment. All the necessary documents. And no debts. She assured. The caregiver advised her to seek employment first. They'll inspect your apartment to ensure it's suitable for a child. If all goes well. There shouldn't be any major obstacles. The caregiver said. Gabby doesn't have any relatives. Just an uncle who's untraceable. He hasn't made any claims for Gabby. And I doubt he ever will. As Margarita headed home. She felt elated. Hopeful that a new life filled with meaning and love might soon begin for her. She found herself already contemplating what to purchase. For Gabby for his initial visit. How to rearrange Daniel's room and. Of course. The pressing need for work. Finding a job was a priority. But Margarita was uncertain where or what kind would suit her best. Regardless. She was open to any job opportunity. As long as the salary wouldn't impede her plans to adopt the child. As she mentally scanned through her acquaintances. She realized there were hardly any individuals she could turn to for assistance. Virtually none at all. When she left her previous job. Some of her colleagues were in tears. Unsure where to seek new employment. I'll probably have to scour through job advertisements. Margarita concluded. Some people seem to get lucky. And I'm certain I'll get lucky too. Was it fate that came to Margarita's aid? It seemed so. As she soon stumbled upon a job opportunity unexpectedly. Her former boss. With whom she had worked for many years. Suddenly reached out to her. The very next day after meeting Gabby. She was asked if she'd secured a job. No. Not at all. When could I have managed that? I just quit. She explained. Well. What are your plans? You probably want some time off to rest. He assumed. No not at all. I don't have time for rest. And I'm not that tired. I really need a job. Margarita insisted. I want to offer you something. I've also left our old workplace and joined another company. Founded by my friend. I'll be heading a department there. And I want to hire people I know well. You're one of them. He offered. The salary will be decent. Much better than what you had in dispatch. And the prospects are quite promising. Thank you so much. Senor Delgado. I didn't expect this. Really. I didn't know where to turn. Still. There's age and some shortcomings I have. Margarita expressed concern. Your age is just right. We'll work on the shortcomings. Don't worry. 
He reassured. Well. I'm kidding. Of course. I know all your shortcomings and. Most importantly. Your strengths. I hope everything will work out for us. I really hope so too. By the way. You will probably provide me with a reference if needed? She asked. Absolutely. He assured her. In short. Everything was falling into place as perfectly as possible. Soon. Margarita had a good job and a stable income. Strangely enough. Her strength seemed to have increased as well. She meticulously cleaned Daniel's room. Which would soon become Gabby's. She visited her future son regularly. And after a few weeks. She was permitted to take him out for weekends. Wow. Is this going to be my room? The boy exclaimed with joy. That's just awesome. I used to have a room too. But it was connected to a bigger one. Not separate. A separate room is so much better. Right? And it even has a balcony. Wow. Yes. But you can't go out on the balcony for now. I sealed the doors so there wouldn't be drafts. Later. We'll get different frames and doors. Maybe even glaze the balcony. Then you'll be able to go out in winter too. But that's for next year. She explained. Cool. You know. Aunt Mara. If you adopt me. Will it be like having a mom? The boy asked. Well. Yes of course. Don't you like that? She inquired. I do. But you know what I don't like. I don't know how I'm going to call you. Mom. I had a different mom before. Can I put her picture on the wall and dad's too? He asked. Of course you can. You can just call me Aunt Mara. I'm not expecting you to call me mom. It's good that you remember your own mom. And you won't be upset. She reassured. How could I be upset? Sweetie. My son was named Daniel. And you're Gabby. I'm not going to call you Daniel. Am I? She replied. Yeah. I really loved my mom and dad. And they loved me too. I couldn't believe for a long time that they wouldn't be around anymore. Did you love your Daniel a lot? The boy cautiously asked. Very much. But you know. Gabby. At some point. I realized that he didn't disappear anywhere. He's always with me. She shared. You understood that sooner. Maybe because kids are more perceptive. He observed. They tried not to dwell on these delicate. Topics and instead focused on discussing their future life together. Due to the loss of his parents. Gabby didn't start first grade in September. He would become a first grader next year. However. Margarita knew that the boy already knew how to read and write. As his mom had taught him. Margarita was pleased that the child seemed adept with studies. Perhaps they wouldn't encounter immediate problems. But she was well aware of the challenges that could arise during adolescence. She grappled with the reality of raising the child alone. Without a father. However. Neither she nor the boy harbored any doubts about being together. Margarita felt a sense of happiness and necessity for the first time in years. She no longer dwelled solely in the forever gone past. Sometimes. Thoughts of the future would occupy her mind. Promising not only happiness but unexpected joys amid forthcoming challenges. Which were simply a part of life. Margarita felt alive and rejoiced in the idea that her son. Might find solace in his new home. Are you happy, my son? She would ask Daniel before bedtime. Feeling his responding smile. The adoption documents for Gabby were nearly complete. Margarita had acquired all the necessary permissions and eagerly awaited the day when Gabby would finally be at home with her. Everything was set. 
and with each trip to the orphanage for another meeting with her future son. She realized that soon she wouldn't need to visit that place anymore. However, on one of her visits before Gabby's arrival, the director requested a conversation in her office. Although Margarita thought it might be about finalizing adoption details, the director's expression was far from joyful. Almost guilty. After ushering Margarita to sit down and pausing her speech, the director intervened. Wait. Margarita Cano. I have news for you. And it's probably not very pleasant. Margarita's alarm surged. What happened? Is something wrong with Gabby? She anxiously inquired. No. Not at all. He's fine. Don't worry. But his biological uncle has appeared. And he wants to take the boy with him. The director explained. This news was like a bolt from the blue for Margarita. She hadn't expected anything like this. At first. She couldn't even grasp the full scope of the tragedy. What do you mean? Take the boy. Will they allow him to do that? I've gathered all the documents. Met all the conditions. She exclaimed, still trying to comprehend the situation. Yes. That's true. But unfortunately. You haven't completed the adoption process yet. And the advantage still lies with the biological relative. He has also gathered all the necessary documents and has a legal right to the child. The director explained. For heaven's sake. What right does he have? He doesn't even know this child. And we've been together for several months now. We're already making plans for our life together. He already considers my home his own. Not just me. And suddenly, some uncle shows up who didn't want to know about him before. Margarita protested. It's not quite like that. He had his circumstances that prevented him from appearing earlier. So he couldn't show up for almost a year. And now, the director started to explain. What does Gabby himself say about this? I don't believe he'll just go with a completely unfamiliar person even if he's a blood relative. And reject me. Margarita pleaded. The thing is. Gabby is not yet 10 years old. And his opinion won't be seriously taken into account. The person who wants to take him is his close biological uncle. Meanwhile. You are a stranger. Unfortunately. The director stated. No. I refuse to understand anything about this. So a child can be given away to anyone without his consent based on some kind of kinship document, and they will refuse a person with whom they have a spiritual bond. Practically a unity. That, you must admit, is inhumane. I just can't believe this. Margarita said, her voice trembling with desperation. She understood that her pleas meant very little. And the director of the orphanage held little sway over the situation. Which was confirmed immediately. You know. I agree with you to some extent. But I have to act according to the letter of the law. Not just personal feelings. The director concluded. It's a tough situation. But don't lose hope completely. Nothing is final yet. It's entirely possible that the decision will be in your favor. Although it's also possible that it won't. But can I at least see Gabby today? Margarita pleaded. I'm sorry. But no. It's not my decision. And it's made in the best interest of the child. The headmistress explained. Margarita realized that pleading. Proving her point or convincing anyone in this situation was utterly useless. She asked the headmistress to inform her about the final decision of the guardianship authorities, bid her goodbye, and left. Snow was falling outside. It came down in soft, fluffy flakes. Something children love. 
she and Daniel used to go for walks in such weather. And it was wonderful. She dreamed of walking like this with Gabby today. Taking a stroll. Catching snowflakes on their tongues. Admiring the snow-covered trees. She could have warned her son not to play in the snow for too long. But now she walked alone. The snow covering her slumped shoulders. Clinging to her eyelashes. Mixing with tears that now it seemed she had no need to hold back. Mascara smears probably flowed down her cheeks. Well. Let it. Who sees her now? Who cares about her? Margarita thought as she sat down on a snow-covered bench. She had no strength to go further. Empty again. No hope again. Why do I lose everyone? She mentally asked. Raising her eyes to the sky. Why do they take everything from me? It would be better not to give anything then. Since I'll have to lose even the last thing. She lowered her head. Covering her face with her hands. Sitting quietly. Covered in snow. Senorita. Are you feeling unwell? Can I help you with something? A pleasant male voice sounded nearby. Now here comes the sympathizer. He'll pity her comfort her and then. Who knows, maybe something will work out. She thought. You're wrong. Mister. She said. Raising her head. I'm not a senorita. And there's nothing for us to achieve. You won't help me with anything. No one will help me anymore. She wanted to get up. But she still had no strength. The stranger. A middle-aged man. Handed her a pack of paper napkins. Luda accepted them with gratitude and began to tidy herself up. The man lingered nearby. Still standing there. What happened to you? I apologize. I don't want to pry into your soul. But you're killing yourself too much. Is it worth it? He asked. Often. People go through things and. After some time looking back. Realize that the trouble wasn't worth it. Everything is solvable. Everything can be fixed. He offered. Not everything. I'm sorry. But my troubles are such that you can't call them solvable or fixable. If you don't want to hear something utterly hopeless. You'd better turn around and go your own way. Thanks a lot for the napkins. Consider that you've already earned some. Kara points. She replied. Finally getting up from the bench and walking down the street. She thought the man would stop. But he didn't. He walked behind her. The snow kept falling. The surroundings quiet. Allowing them to talk freely. No. I'm sorry. Now I definitely can't just turn around and leave. The man said firmly. I have to listen and find out what happened. Believe me. Sometimes just talking about your problems is already half of their solution. Trust me. It's not mere curiosity. Well fine. Let's say you're a priest or a wizard or some trendy. Therapist who believes that any problem can be talked away. Chatted about. And forgotten. Margarita replied. I'll repeat. If at any point during my story you turn around and hurry away. I won't consider you a coward or a runaway. You're not obligated to listen to such confessions. So. I'll start. Five years ago. My son died. The only beloved. The most wonderful person. I was left all alone. How do you suggest I fix that? I can't. I remained alive for five years. Somehow breathed. Got up in the morning. Went to work. My husband left me right after the funeral. He considered our union exhausted. I don't know how he's living now. I'm not interested in that. For five years. I lived my life. Transferred to another job where I needed less interaction with people. Where I didn't have to upset them with my appearance. 
infect them with my unhappiness. But even that job ended. I got laid off. About my husband. As I've said. I forgot. Recently managed to find another job. And now it turns out I don't need this either. Because some time ago. It seemed I could live on and be needed. I met a boy. A little orphan boy whose parents died. Somehow. We immediately became friends. Even loved each other. I almost decided to adopt him. All documents collected. Apartment in order. Ready to meet the young new owner. Everything seemed fine. I could start anew and be happy. Well. Yes probably. But judging by your mood. Something hindered. Margarita explained. Listen. There's a nice cafe over there. Let's go in and continue our conversation. Let's not freeze. Although honestly. It's not that cold. Wonderful weather today. Yes. She suggested. Something hindered. Continued Margarita. As they sat at the table in the cafe and placed their order. Margarita shared. With my Gabby. Yes. I already considered him mine. Suddenly. Some blood relative appeared. He hadn't been around since the boy's parents died. Or maybe even earlier. I don't know. Gabby himself doesn't remember. And now. All of a sudden. He appeared and wants to take the boy for himself. All advantages on his side. As he's a blood relative. Gabby's not even ten yet. So his opinion doesn't count. Too young. And me? Consider me practically absent from this story. Just a distant woman who wanted to adopt but didn't work out. And now. I won't even see the boy I've grown so fond of. Margarita's voice quivered again. She felt she would soon start crying. Tears that wouldn't help anything. Why won't you meet? Maybe this uncle won't forbid you from meeting. He lives in another city. And it's unclear whether he'll need these meetings. Perhaps he himself wants to adopt the child. In other words. Become his father. And has a wife or fiancé willing to become a mother. So. Again. I'm an unnecessary element. I need to talk to the uncle. But he's in a different city. Not another country. I could still meet him. And going there takes less than a day. How do you know? Margarita was surprised by the man's statement. I am that very uncle. Andre is my name. Sorry for not introducing myself right away. But even I didn't immediately understand who. You are and what the conversation was about. I won't let you and Gabby part forever. I promise you that. Thank you. But why didn't you take the boy right away? Why decide to show up only now? Didn't you know about his parents' death? That they placed the boy in an orphanage? Of course. I knew from the very beginning. I thought I needed to do it. But I also had circumstances. You understand. Unfortunately, not everything depends on us and our desires. You surely know that yourself. My circumstances weren't as tragic as yours. But still. I couldn't adopt a child. I was going through a divorce with my wife. Actually. The divorce was tough. We lived together for 15 years. No children. Actually. There was nothing. I don't even know why we lived together. Then we realized we couldn't stand each other and couldn't love each other. We decided to divorce. The divorce. I repeat. Was not easy. Plus exchanging the apartment. I lived wherever I could for half a year. Finally. Everything got sorted out. There's an apartment quite suitable for a child to live in. Gabby is my only relative. That's how it turns out. His father was my younger blood brother. 
Now. Besides Gabby. I have no one. And I have no one besides him. And living now is utterly pointless. Why do you say that? We'll come up with something. And don't say you have no reason to live. Live for yourself. For the memory of your son. For Gabby. Finally. I've met him more than once. The boy only talks about you. I see how attached he is to you. You're very important to him. Margie. Maybe we didn't meet for nothing. Andre said. Margarita looked up at the man and, for the first time, really observed him closely. Margarita observed her contemporary, noting his handsome features. She grappled with the implications of the phrase, maybe we didn't meet for nothing. From her perspective, it might have been better if Uncle Andre had never appeared. How could they divide one boy? How would they manage travel between their cities? Although it was less than a day's journey and the ticket probably wasn't expensive. These sad thoughts lingered in Margarita's mind. However, amidst these bleak considerations, something entirely different was growing inside her soul. She couldn't quite understand it herself. But Andre also couldn't help but notice the sparks. That ignited in her eyes from time to time. She appeared to be trying to remember something. Feelings that hadn't visited her for a long time. I understand. Margarita. What you're thinking about. You don't want to part with Gabby. And you understand that seeing each other will be quite a strain. Now you have work. He'll have school. I have a job too. By the way. We won't even be able to visit each other once a week. And for people who are dear to each other. Meeting once a month is too little. Andre voiced his contemplations. Maybe I should move to your city. There's not much keeping me here. I'm originally from here. I moved there for work. Yes. Work is very important. But I could find a place just as good here. He suggested. Trying to find a viable solution. Let me offer my version then. Margarita interjected. Just listen. Please. Don't interrupt. Let go of the idea of taking the boy. I think Gabby himself won't be against it. And nothing will change for you. You will remain his uncle. His blood relative. And I'll become his foster mother. Then we can start thinking about living arrangements. Visits. Communication. Whether you move to our city or I to yours is also possible. Albeit more complex. But for the sake of the child. I'm ready for anything. And with time. I believe the situation will normalize. I can't suddenly just let go. Andre expressed. Grappling with the suggestion. You won't be giving up on him. The boy will live with me. He's young right now. He needs a mother more than a father. Isn't that right? After all. I have experience with a child of his age. And you can visit any time I won't stand in the way. And when Gabby grows a little. Maybe he'll want to live with you himself. And I again won't object. Do you think that's an option? Andre asked. Bewildered. Why not? I'm grateful to you for not wanting to separate us. Even being willing to move for it. But think for a moment how much time and effort it would take. And the child will keep living in the orphanage. And if there's no moving involved. Then it will end up just as I said initially. With me remaining a complete stranger to Gabby. Margarita reasoned. Maybe you're right. But it's also difficult for me to suddenly step back from taking my nephew. I think we should do this. Let's talk to Gabriel together. Explain the situation to him. I think my version would suit him better. Andre suggested. Yes. You're right. We probably need to talk to Gabriel himself. Margarita agreed. The next morning. 
they headed to the orphanage. This time, both candidates for adopting the boy were allowed in. They called for Gabby. And upon seeing both his uncle and Aunt Mara, he rushed towards them, spreading his arms wide for a hug, embracing them both. You both came at the same time. That's so great. I wanted you both to come together. He said. Then quieted down puzzled. Aunt Mara. Do you know that Uncle Andy also wants to take me with him? I know. Gabby. But let's talk about it a little later. Let's go. Let's all take a walk together. There's so much snow piled up. Margarita replied. They had a wonderful walk and decided to have a serious conversation at a cafe. During their walk, Gabby, initially absorbed in his thoughts, grew puzzled again as he looked from one adult to the other. Sensing his confusion, Margarita initiated the difficult conversation. Gabby, your uncle and I are thinking about who you'll be with now. You know me better. And I already have a home. But Andre is your real uncle. Your closest relative. So. Are you refusing me? Gabby's eyes filled with tears. I will never refuse you. Just understand. You can't live in two places at once. That's why we came together to ask you. Who would you like to live with? We both love you very much. We both need you. But the final decision is yours. Margarita explained. Feeling a sense of shame for putting the child in such a position. Gabby sat there. Bewildered. Unsure of how to answer. I don't know whom to choose. I don't want to choose. He said. Tears welling up. It's all right. Calm down. Andre reassured. If I'm planning to move to the city anyway, why don't we exchange our two apartments for a larger one? That way, everything will be great. Hooray! That's a great idea you came up with. Gabby brightened up immediately. And we'll all be together like one family. Aunt Mara. Are you okay with this? Of course. Margarita agreed. A bit flustered. It's just not something that can be done quickly. Despite Margarita's lack of optimism, she didn't want to upset the child and remained agreeable. It was quite a promise I made back there. Wasn't it? Andre asked. A bit embarrassed after they dropped Gabby back at the orphanage. I don't know. It was necessary to reassure Gabby. Of course. But how are you going to manage now? Margarita pondered. I don't know. And should I? The idea really isn't entirely unreasonable. In any case. It might take quite a while before it's implemented. We'll see how things go from there. Yes. You're probably right. Your plan was just so unexpected that I got a bit flustered. I need to focus on the adoption and everything else. Let it all unfold as it will. Not everything depends on our desires. Margarita reflected. Their plans took quite a bit of time to come to fruition. The adoption of Gabby was the fastest part. Margarita prepared well and soon became the official. Mother of the boy she befriended in such an unusual way. However. Dealing with the rest turned out to be much more time consuming. But after two years. Margarita. Andre and Gabby were already living in a spacious four-bedroom apartment like a regular complete family, a united and happy one. Margarita and Andre got married, officially becoming Gabby's parents, a role they were gradually getting used to. Each of them had experienced substantial losses, which taught them to value family, kinship, good relationships, and each other. As Margarita was getting ready to celebrate her 45th birthday, she received a card from Gabby, which read, Mommy, 
I love you. It was the first time he called her. Mom. Margarita placed the card on the shelf next to. One she found among Daniel's belongings. Whispering silently. Everything is good with us.